this talk is going to cover a whole bunch of stuff. And I want to make you think. Um, and so I'm going to go through a bunch of ideas pretty quick. And uh, let's see if any of it sticks. I'd like to start some conversations um, and take a look at um, where we are in the industry to a certain extent, but look at you know, how we got here and um, where we might be headed. And with that, um, you know, how did we get here? I don't, I don't mean like this, but how did we get here as an industry? Although if anybody did come down in a Gulfstream 650 ER this morning, if you could give me a ride home tomorrow, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, and in our careers, we usually don't even have a map to go by because stuff changes really quick. Uh, first, a disclaimer, I am ignorant. I don't know anything. I've been doing this for years, not as long as people think, but I've been doing it for decades. Uh, I started out, I'm a displaced auto mechanic. The last time I, was, I considered myself an expert in anything, it was Renault automobiles. Uh, that level of masochism prepared me for InfoSec. Um, but... Don't laugh, we all are. One of the things we love about a career in InfoSec is there is always stuff to learn. It's changing, there are always challenges. Every now and then we'd like them to dial down just a little bit, but there's a lot to learn. Um, but when we talk about history, there's some challenges. So uh, if we think about music and trying to figure out how modern music got where it was, um, so I'm old, so modern music means classic rock, uh, but let's think about this. Join me, uh, let's see if we can do this. Back in the uh, 19 teens, we had some Middle Eastern folk music, and in the 20s, started uh, in America getting more Jewish folk music, which was uh, a progression of that, slightly Americanized. This is a much later recording, obviously. Then we moved to the 30s, and Robert Johnson and many others brought us Delta Blues. Come into the 40s, we get Chicago Blues, we get Electric Blues, we get people like B.B. and uh, Howlin' Wolf. And then in the 50s, two guys that don't get the credit they deserve changed everything. This is Link Ray. The people that heard this song for the first time heard the first power chords ever played. When he played Rumble for the first time, he improvised it and brought us the power chord. That introduction made them uh, perform that song three times the first night that he improvised it, um, 1957. Uh, he was a former country uh, duet with his brother, but uh, was trying to go electric at a time when a lot of people were. Um, that's a two and a half minute song in the middle. He started playing with what, uh, you know, early simple shredding. And at the end, he started twisting knobs. started playing with effects like twisting the vibrato up to 11. One two and a half minute song um, did a lot to change it. And if you take those things and a logical progression, this is the kind of stuff he was doing just a few years later, which sounds like heavy metal and all sorts of things years before that was a term. A peer of his, Dick Dale took that classic Middle Eastern, and then of course the one we all know him best, this one, which was made popular with the, uh, um, yeah, you know, the Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, and so we've taken this tour of American history, and then what happens? Some Brits listen to some blues. And now we have a foundation for rock and roll for several decades of borrowing from the blues and bringing it forward. Taking the bass riffs, building on them and taking even the lyrics intact. And then there are other folks that are under, this one's just uh, 
you know, where did punk come from? It was an attitude. Uh, where did grunge come from a couple of decades later based on punk? Um, I'd argue, if you're not familiar with these guys, That's what you were expecting from a 1965 rock group, right? Uh, no, the, they, uh, those guys influenced everybody from Springsteen to Nirvana to the White Stripes, the Cramps, the Dead Boys, the Flaming Lips, and others. Um, nowhere near as influential as the Velvet Underground, but a lot like Velvet Underground. They didn't sell well. You know, it's, it's been said that Velvet Underground sold 30,000 albums and everybody who bought one uh, formed a band. Um, but what if... You know, and it's easy to do with music, because music moves us. Um, if you actually are interested in this and have not really given it a thought, there's a, a documentary on the history of the electric guitar called It Might Get Loud, and it's Jack White, The Edge, and Jimmy Page um, just nerding out about the history of the electric guitar. Um, there are a couple of scenes in there that are amazing. Jimmy Page listening to the uh, original recording of Rumble. Um, he can't help himself but play air guitar to it. Um, and then there's another scene uh, laid in where they're all playing together, and at one point, Jack White and The Edge just kind of like stop and completely nerd out, fanboy out, like, holy shit, I'm playing guitar with Jimmy Page. Um, <sighs> you know, Herbie Hancock, if you want a, a single artist, watch it, follow Herbie Hancock from a musical prodigy of classical music through... Um, some of the most beloved traditional jazz of the 60s, Watermelon Man, you can't go anywhere without hearing clips of that. Um, to his avant-garde jazz, to funk and hip-hop and the foundations of hip-hop, uh, BBC4, a different approach, instead of following a musical instrument or a, uh, a single artist, um, the song Summertime from the uh, musical Porgy and Bess has been covered more than any song in history. And it goes through the history of music. And it goes from, you know, m making it to becoming a, an almost standard in Brazilian jazz to uh, Janice Joplin's iconic blues rock, just absolute agony um, and beauty wrapped up in that gravel voice to it being used as an anthem during the race riots just a few years later. Now... Let's take a look at that with InfoSec. Oh yeah, no, we can't really. We don't have a lot of good resources. There are a couple of them, but we don't know where we got here. So why look back? Because um, we're not that old in industry. And just like it says on that side of your car, assuming you're not in the UK, um, that, that history, the objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Uh, first, why don't we know all of this stuff? Um, things were different. People did security as part of technology. They did security as part of what they did. Uh, it was originally an afterthought. Um, it wasn't a business. It was mostly surround, centered around government and military and crypto. We can't keep up. No matter whether you entered this industry last week or you're hoping to cross from technology into security soon, there are people hiring over there, by the way, so talk to them. Um, or you've been at it for decades, we hit the ground running and can't look back. And so that's part of the reason I started this Shoulders of InfoSec project, is to make it easier for us to look back. Um, if you publish and Google doesn't index it, did you ever publish? Uh, well, pre-internet, a lot of that stuff's gone. Although uh, Gary, um, I mean, yeah, Davis at UC, uh, no, I'll get his name right eventually, Matt. Anyway, UC Davis, I've got links to it, uh, has a bunch of early papers. Uh, they were military, government, and education. And those of us in the industry don't like those people because they're bad. They're idiots. They don't know what the real world looks like. Uh, and we'll tell you that, and then they'll tell you we don't understand uh, doing low bid, low budget, and trying to defend the nation. And uh, education is like, look, we may be in an ivory tower. We've got brilliant ideas. Just listen to us and let work together. And then we don't. Um, we think they're clueless. They sometimes think we're clueless. Sometimes we all are. Uh, a lot of them are no longer active. A lot of these early figures, many have retired, uh, many have passed away. Worse yet, some of them have moved into management, the poor buggers. They're not on the con circuit, certainly not our con circuit. So let's trace our roots. Let's look at a couple of folks that you all should know the names. 
Um, Diffie Hellman. Everybody knows Diffie Hellman. It's how we can exchange keys securely, pretty much, over an untrusted network. Um, and these guys, you know, their names are, are common names. The Diffie Hellman Key Exchange is a fundamental underpinning of the internet. Um, they're both brilliant people and actually have real passions. They're actual human beings behind this. But Hellman wouldn't have been Hellman if it weren't for his partner, Ralph Merkel, that most people don't know unless you're a crypto nerd. Hellman is, Marty has, uh, has repeatedly said that, uh, you know, he didn't get the, the credit he deserved. So I like to point out him. Um, these three dudes, uh, you might know what they've done. If you don't know, let me put them in order and capitalize some stuff and maybe you'll figure that out. These are actual humans with, that invented a ton of uh, symmetric key algorithms, voting systems based on paper because Ron Rivest doesn't think that, uh, thinks democracy is too important to trust the technology. Ron Rivest thinks we should use paper for voting because you can't trust technology. Um, Adi and Lynn continue to do things. But you probably don't know these three dudes, right? Uh, unless you're a crypto nerd. Uh, Jim Ellis, in 1970, was at GCHQ, the UK's version of NSA, sort of, pretty much. Um, and that was still Cold War times. That was before they started looking at us and things. Um, he wrote a paper describing what he called non-secret encryption. Uh, 1970. Uh, basically, he defined what we now call and have called for decades public key cryptography. Uh, Cox was a um, brilliant math student, and in 73, he joined GCHQ. They didn't know what to do with him. They said, oh, hey, Jim wrote this paper. Why don't you read it and figure something out? I don't know. Um, he read it worked out the details of some of his ideas. I came up with a, a critical algorithm um, that they used, um, which some years later would be invented by Rivest, Shamir, and Alderman and called RSA. Uh, but he invented it first, or you know, tuned it up and made it work. Uh, he went on to become, uh, to invent identity-based crypto and eventually became chief uh, mathematician at GCHQ uh, so that's a uh, pretty bright dude. College buddy of his joins GCHQ a few months later. They don't know what to do with him either. So Malcolm, here. Here's Jim's paper. He's Brit, so they didn't call him Jim. They called him James. Um, they handed him the paper. <laughs> 74. He figured out a way to exchange keys, crypto keys, over an untrusted network. Worked it out. Came up with a way that Diffie and Hellman invented a few years later. None of this was declassified until 97. Uh, the old man, uh, James, was gone, was dead by then. Um, it's a classic case about parallel discovery or pre-discovery, and there are a couple of really key takeaways to it. One, I don't care how brilliant you are, somebody may have thought of it before, have a little bit of humility. Two, that doesn't mean you can't do more with it than they did. They had this all classified. They didn't change the world with it like Ravest, Shamir, Alderman, Diffie, and Hellman did. They built the internet privacy and security mechanisms while these guys sat on some really cool stuff. So other people, um, you must know Alan Turing. Uh, just, just kidding. Um, we owe a lot to Alan Turing. But one of the names that people don't know is Henrik Zagalski. In the late 30s, Henrik and two other Poles uh, cracked Enigma using Zagalski sheets, paper sheets that Henrik designed and were able to regularly, not as reliably with, as with the computer that was created um, in Bletchley Park, but were regularly able to uh, decrypt Enigma messages. Um, but they were Poles, they got overrun in the war, uh, and they, he was not played by Bumble, Cumber, whatever. Um, uh, let's dive into a few more folks. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but these are people I think you should know, and some of them you hopefully do, some you don't, and then we're going to like try to think and stuff. I hope you don't mind. I hope you've had either enough coffee or enough of the uh, 
nice mimosas to be able to think. Uh, Grace Hopper, this is a gotcha. Hopefully you know her stories. If not, you've got homework. Um, if you want a really quick introduction, uh, find the YouTube of her on the David Letterman show. It is, uh, it, it's great. It gets a little funky at the end. She gets into names and stuff. Uh, but she has great stories. When you talk to old farts in the business, uh, they may tell you, especially if her name comes up, if they tell you that they've got a nanosecond, um, that means they've actually met and talked to her. She is deceased, but uh, that was one of her big deals was handing people nanoseconds. Little tiny pieces of wire, the length that it took um, things to travel, uh, a, a pack, not a packet, but this is how far data can go in a nanosecond. In explaining to, uh, she came up with that and explained why it took so long to get messages to ships at sea. Uh, she retired an admiral. She actually retwi retired three times. The first two didn't take, and they brought her back in. Uh, she started programming when programming meant putting patch cables across connectors. When they invented dip switches and she started programming, that was a major advance in, an, in a programming language, if you will. Her programming language went from patch cables to dip switches and then advanced dramatically from there. Um, she wrote the first compiler because she got really tired of writing everything all the way out in machine language. Uh, she's where we get the term debugging. Uh, the early computers used mechanical relays, electromechanical relays. There was a moth caught between the contacts. She pulled the moth out. Thus, she debugged the first operation. Um, we owe her a lot. Here's somebody that not many people know. She's one of the most brilliant cryptanalysts that the NSA ever had. Worked uh, through World War II, through the Cold War. Uh, there were people at NSA who said, that, you know, if, if my life depends on it and a message has to be broken, you go get Anne. Uh, that's how much respect she had. Uh, she made it up through deputy director of the NSA. Uh, we lost her just a few months ago. Um, now let's think. Wow, those are two amazingly brilliant and powerful women in InfoSec. Uh, and it wasn't that bizarre. Uh, well, broke through all sorts of uh, barriers. Somebody that's still with us, uh, Spaff. If you have the chance to sit down, he's hysterically funny. Um, he is brilliant. Um, founded the Sirius Institute at uh, Purdue. They uh, generated uh, the first, you know, hundreds, thousands of people with, with, a, with a PhD in information assurance. Um, he rocks the bow tie great sense of humor. His politics are extremely left. You can argue opinion with him all day. I wouldn't argue fact with uh, Spaff. Uh, because besides um, being a um, professor of computer science, he is a full professor in philosophy, communication, electrical engineering, computer engineering, and political science. Um, like I said, argue opinion all you want. Uh, fact, probably not. Folks like Dan Farmer and Gene Kim are some of his earlier stuff. He's an advisor to a bunch of things. And also, because he's been around and done a lot of firsts, he's also a bit of a historian. Unfortunately, one of the, the great values to me is that he writes obituaries and tributes to some of the folks we've lost. Uh, Becky Bass is another one not well known unless you're a network analysis nerd. She went by the handle Den Mother of Intrusion Detection. She found out I was still calling her that um, and gave me grief for it. She wants to be called the Cranky Broad. Basically, the folks that founded the network analysis, intrusion detection uh, parts of our industry uh, were helped along by Becky. She connected people, and she connected people with funding to make those things move forward. Um, went into consulting after NSA, where she was doing all that. And then when she left, she uh, had left South uh, um, Alabama to um, get a government job and marry a Yankee. And her dad said, that's OK, but when you're done doing all of that stuff, we need you back here at home. So when she should be retired, uh, she has moved home to Alabama and is teaching at the University of South Alabama because they need her. She's kind of awesome like that. This dude, he might be a little young for uh, this list, but he's got a lot of firsts. <clears throat> he's why we have a cert. Um, Spaff did the forensic analysis of that. First person charged and convicted under the CFAA in 1989, sentenced to three years probation in 90. Three years probation because there was no malicious intent, but he did unleash uh, a worm on the early internet. The reason I put him here is not just that he's significant for 
making us address what happens when bad things happen, but because one of the things, those of us that self-identify as hackers but are in the infosec world, we have this struggle with hackers, right? We have the, and we talk about the reformed hacker. Right? So there's uh, Kevin and Mitnick is Mitnick, right? So there's whatever. Um, there's Mark Mayfrey, who never got arrested. The FBI knocked at the door as a teenager. He's like, oh, sh I think I'm going to start a company and I'm, I'm going to go pretty much straight except for hair. And that's, that was cool. Um, after being the first person charged and convicted under CFAA, he went on to do some stuff. He co-founded ViaWeb. He is the co-founder of Y Combinator. This year, he celebrates his 10th year as a tenured professor in computer science and electrical engineering at MIT. Should you need to refer to a reformed hacker, might I suggest someone who, um, <laughs> yeah, Robert Morris. Now, meanwhile, his kid had just, I mean, his father uh, spent uh, decades at Bell Labs, worked on Multics, which is like pre-Unix, worked on that newfangled Unix stuff when it was being invented. Then he left um, in 86 and joined NSA. And a couple of years later, the FBI and his boss called him into a conference room to explain that they were picking up his kid at uh, school for doing what he did. Um, he had a couple of quotes that I liked. Never underestimate the attention, risk, money, and time that an opponent will put into reading traffic. Past few years have shown us that's absolutely true. Um, for those of you that like to do crypto challenges at cons uh, or into crypt analysis, rule number one of crypt analysis, check for plain text. Um, he also had rules for securing computers. He had three rules. Uh, don't own a computer. If you do, don't power it on. If you have to power it on, at least don't use it. Um, <laughs> huh. So people like to say they're futurists, and it's April now, and so we've all forgotten all the crap pre uh, predictions that people make at the end of the year, and we don't hold them to, and they're garbage. Um, if someone were to say something like, the computer will touch men everywhere and in every way, almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, Every man will communicate through a computer whatever he does. It will change and reshape his life, modify his career, and force him to accept a life of continuous change. Right now, we'd say, yeah, I can see that. In 1966, when Willis Ware told us that, many people didn't believe him. He was kind of a visionary. We'll come back to Willis and the Ware report shortly, but... He worked in the war on uh, IFF, Identify Friend or Foe, and Radar Systems, uh, so that we didn't shoot down our own and shot down theirs. He was at RAND for 40 years, 52 to 92. Um, the Ware Report started in 67, final edition was 70 or 71, uh, is a foundational document. We'll dig into that in a little bit more in a minute here. Um, he's also the one that convinced the Ford administration we needed a uh, Privacy Act. Our first Privacy Act came out of because he understood the power of computers. He understood their power to be used against us and why we needed to ensure our privacy. Um, he's only been gone uh, about a year and a half, two years now, just over, uh, it was 93. It's only been a couple of years since uh, he passed away. Um, an amazing figure. Peter Newman. Um, when he was an undergrad, uh, he had breakfast with Einstein, and one of the things they talked about was complexity. Complexity makes stuff hard to secure. If you chat with Einstein about complexity, you have some views on complexity and simplicity and things. Uh, and that was influential to his perspective. Um, he was at Bell Labs for decades, then SRI, worked on Multics, and then worked on something called the Provably Secure Operating System. I kind of laugh at that idea now, but uh, he worked on, it was actually headed in that direction uh, before stuff happened. Editor of uh, Risks Digest. Dorothy Denning, she's known for a couple of things. Um, she's the first person that came up with the idea of establishing a mathematical basis for enforcing information security on a system. A uh, lattice model of secure information flow was the paper she wrote. Uh, early on, she was very sympathetic with the early hackers, thinking they're not doing that much damage, they're curious, we should uh, work with them. Uh, and then they started breaking things and doing things that were more than just mischievous. They became malicious and she changed her mind. Um, she was also earned the name Clipper Chick because she was a supporter of 
the clipper chip. Um, and uh, man, I thought we had won that one a long time ago, but we didn't, um, as you know. She was at Purdue for a while, then at SRI, then at Georgetown. Now both she and her husband uh, are professors at the Naval Postgrad School. Steve Crocker invented the RFC. Um, he didn't invent all of them, but he wrote number one. Did things like develop the protocols for ARPANET while he was a student. He was one of the, part of the team that developed the protocols that were used for communication on ARPANET. Um, worked at DARPA, USC, a whole bunch of startups. Hal Finney I throw in because he's someone you don't know. When after the crypto wars were won the first time, because we're now in crypto war two or whatever, um, when Phil Zimmerman was able to actually build a company, that was the first person he hired was Hal Finney. Um, he was an advocate of anonymous and cryptocurrencies. For a while, people thought he might have been Satoshi. Um, he passed away from ALS just a couple of years ago. Um, but he was also highly interested in cryonics, so maybe we'll have him back. Uh, so. <clears throat> Steve Lipner uh, went to school, wasn't really a security specialist. Uh, he got a job at MITRE, and uh, they asked him to do security stuff, and he said he'd do it only until they can hire the right person. He's remained in computing ever since, from MITRE to DEC to Microsoft, uh, was a contributor to the Orange Book. He's one of the founders of the recently deceased Microsoft Trustworthy Computing Program, recently announced retirement from Microsoft. Um, here's another one that doesn't get the credit he deserves. Bob Abbott, movie Sneakers? Anybody seen the Sneakers? Of course you have. Um, sneakers is based on uh, his team, the first red team inside NSA. The, um, James Earl Jones character in uh, the end of that was named uh, Bernard Abbott, I believe, uh, as, a, as a, yeah, Bernard Abbott, as a tribute to Bob. Um, he's arguably the first person to make a career out of security as a consultant, did little things like wrote the first real-time operating system for 24 by seven operation for Cray class computers. Um, wrote software for physiological monitoring for the first open heart patients. Was also uh, a contributor to a report we'll talk, on, uh, talk about in just a minute. Um, last one I wanna talk about briefly is Jim Anderson. This is somebody that went from meteorology, then became a gunnery officer, and then became a radio officer because he was good with stuff and was an InfoSec pioneer. Um, what he's most known for in government is the uh, author of the Anderson Report, which drove Air Force security for decades starting in the 70s, which then drove security for the entire rest of the military and trickled out into government. Um, deeply involved in Orange Book and, and most of the Rainbow series, um, from UNIVAC to Burroughs uh, and beyond, um, from SPAF's obit to him. Let me just, Anderson had broad interests, deep concerns, great insight, and a rare willingness to operate out of the spotlight. His sense of humor and patience with those earnestly seeking knowledge were greatly admired, as were his candid responses to the clueless and self-important. I think we could all do that. It's, somebody needs help, somebody's new, they're asking you questions, find some humor, find some patience, help them pull forward. Somebody's self-important ass, treat them that way. Um, so where are we now? There's some questions I've been asking for a few years and I don't have the answers, but I'm gonna like pretend I do and stuff. So imagine all of InfoSec is divided into three buckets with kittens in them, because I haven't had any kittens in the slides yet and that's, I, I probably get rushed off the stage if I don't have cats soon. So let's um, define it, the, uh, the far two are related. This one, how well have we defined the problem space in information security? And the next one is, how well have we defined the solution space? And then the, now you know why that last cat is frowning, because he's how well we've deployed those things, right? And you can make a case for this, because new problems crop up every day, and we're always chasing to find solutions. And as far as deploying the solutions we've found, that's terribly optimistic. But what happens if we abstract it from yesterday's flash zero day, or tomorrow's flash zero day, or next Wednesday's flash zero day, to classes of bugs. What if we abstract it, you know? Uh, Mark Dowd hasn't come up with a new class of bugs that he can exploit in years now. So, uh, and how many of them do we actually know how to deal with? 
at an abstraction layer as opposed to that, and how well have we done it? Um, you know, we know how to do authentication and authorization and input sanitization, we just don't do it well. Uh, sometimes it's not worth it. The steady factors poor deployment across them. So here's my question. Um, we have all these solutions that people aren't using. Stupid management people won't do what we tell them. What's up with that? Two questions. If you've solved the problem a dozen times and no one uses our solutions, have we really solved it? If it's not a usable solution, we haven't really solved it. And then the other one we get on, uh, not to pick on RSA because there are other cons, but that's the one that's really easy to do. Walk around the expo floor and look at the vendors selling you solutions to problems that no one has. Um, is it really a problem? It's like, that's a problem because I had an idea to solve it. Well, it's not your problem. Um, so common wisdom, I, I've used these, this joke for a bit, but it's still true. You have to think outside the box. Uh, doing security properly is like trying to nail jello to a tree. Well, it turns out that if you think inside the box, it's really easy to nail jello to a tree. Um, and so as far as InfoSec, we haven't done nothing. There's a lot inside that box. Um, by the way, my neighbors tend to think I'm a little weird. When I was nailing that to the tree in the front yard and snapping pictures of it, uh, they were like, at least he doesn't have the chainsaw out yet. Um, uh, they, uh, every time I use the chainsaw, they think of Texas Chainsaw Massacre because I am, uh, I don't know if you guys know, I am a native of Texas, almost. Um, I was born and raised in Dallas, which is kind of like Texas, but not really. Um, <laughs> I, I was, lived in Oak Cliff, uh, so I was south of the river, uh, and uh, spent, actually grew up in East Texas the weekends uh, on my uncle's ranch. So, like I said, almost a Texan. Um, grew up here in the 60s and 70s. Eisenhower baby, yeah. Uh, I still, uh, as, a, as a non-believer, I still like want to faced Lady Bird's uh, flower ranch and genuflect or something, because that's, that's as close as we Texans get to a, a patron saint, right? That's Lady Bird, you know. I don't care what your politics are. Don't talk bad about Lady Bird. The worst thing you can say about her is she had bad taste in men. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people that like LBJ. I, 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 my politics are, I don't even agree with myself, so we won't go there. Um, the history of computer security. I built a timeline. Um, this is awesome. Uh, this pretty much sums it up. <clears throat> Once we had fairly simple systems and we weren't worried about security. Uh, we started to freak out about security when they ran a copper wire and put a terminal over there. And then they had the nerve to run the copper wire into the next room so you as the operator couldn't even see who was at the terminal. And they kept running them further and further and then we started worrying about stuff. Um, Single user, single process. Uh, we had no security, but we didn't really need it. And as it got more complicated, it was theoretically possible to secure things and that people were working on it. Uh, BBN's 10X was the first attempt at a really secure operating system. They made some fundamental errors, uh, but they were able to address them. Um, but it was you know, mainframe stuff, so it wasn't getting us where we needed to go in, in modern times. Uh, but then we got more complex, multi-user, multi-process, makes it harder to secure, uh, but we were getting better at it. And then a handful of things happened in the middle uh, that I believe we have to keep in mind at all times, and it, the Internet of Things makes this clear. Uh, we got three things, global interconnectivity. That meant the bad guys are, um, you know, I forget who said it, Bad guys are 150 milliseconds away from anywhere in the world. Um, unless you're on Time Warner Cable, maybe 500 milliseconds. <laughs> um, we got commoditization of hardware and software, especially hardware at first, which drove consumerization of it. We got computers in our homes. We started using computers in small businesses. They became more approachable. They had no security. You could do all sorts of stuff. You had to write your own programs or copy them out of a magazine or off of a BBS or something to get stuff to work in the early days, and so they had to be open and free. Um, but we commoditized over the course of a decade or so. We commoditized and consumerized hardware. 
So now when we talk about the Internet of Things, why is there such a problem? All this has to do is take a temperature reading and go up or down and compare it to a clock, and yeah, we're done, right? So that's a, that's a couple dozen lines of code, and we're done. But if you do that in, you know, even you know, the mortal remains of QNX or something fairly light and, and securable, then it, it's not compiled, people don't know how to do it. It's cheaper to get a cheap full processor and run a full Linux stack on that sucker to do three or four calls, right? Um, Marcus Ranum, friend and, and coworker. Um, side note, for, for a while, uh, Marcus Ranum, Space Rogue, and I were on a team together. And for those of you who have been in the business a while, I want you to think about what that means. That means Space Rogue was the young idealist on our team. Um, and then Space Rogue went off to another thing, and Marcus and I are together, and it gets more terrifying because that makes Marcus the young one and me the idealist. Uh, it's terrifying. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> Marcus was consulting a bank about an early ATM system. And he was like, you should use QNX. It needs to do these things. We can do this. I mean, you know, it's, you can have a stripped down, lightweight, fast code. Um, it won't, nothing's perfectly secure, but you're going to reduce your attack service. They're like, we're going to use Windows NT4. Why would you do that? Because we want the splash screen to look like this. It's like, okay, so we'll, we'll represent it. Yeah, but they developed the splash screens using PowerPoint, and it has to be something that supports PowerPoint viewer, and thus the bank rolled out NT4 workstation for ATMs. Commoditization of hardware and software led to stuff like that. The great thing is they're not running NT4 anymore. They're all running Windows 98 and XP. Um, <coughs> Problem solved. Um, I need to launch because I'm running a little long, but we'll dive in. The where report, if you haven't read it, it's worth it. It's outdated, it's obsolete, but it's not. Um, certainly control will be cheapest if it's considered a system architecture prior to hardware and software design. Hey, let's think about security before we build this stuff. 1967. User convenience is an important aspect of achieving security control because it determines whether or not users tend to find ways to get around, ignore, or subvert controls. 67. This is one of the images in there. That's horribly dated. Now, change a couple of words and a couple of pictures, and I can teach fundamental computer security with this today. Another report, much more dated, but the, uh, this goes by the RISOS, Research into Secure Operating Systems, um, led by Abbott. Dated, there are some relevant bits, there's some lessons in the uh, BBN 10X uh, stuff and resolutions. Um, uh, so this is early 70s. Document will be especially useful. If it reduces the current tendency to repeat it. Oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, how'd that work out? Well, let's see. They identified seven critical things. Now, first, it is a lot easier to identify a problem than solve it. But if you don't identify it well, you're not going to solve it well. First thing, incomplete parameter validation. Yeah, we got that one nailed. Nope. Um, inconsistent parameter. I didn't mean for it to... Uh. Okay, we're getting better, though. Um, privilege... Uh, okay, we must have done something right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Race conditions and uh, time to check out versus time of use. Yeah, we still haven't got... Uh, um, oh, authentication, oh, you can't even... Um, <laughs> uh, we put limits in that people can go around. I might have been at a federal facility this week, found an authentication bypass on the NAC on their wireless system. It was kind of embarrassing. At the end of the conference, walked up with my business card, said, hey, great conference, thank you very much. You need to have your network security team call me uh, off bypass NAC thing. Guys, like, th thank, oh. <laughs> good thing I was escorted into this room. Uh, good, good thing the guards at the gates are carrying automatic weapons. Um, anyway, <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, logic errors, we got this. Now, here's the great thing. It's not like we've thrown money down the toilet by putting tons of research into 10X, Multex, early versions of Unix, IRIX, NT4, OSX, Windows 98. It's not like we've spent untold billions securing those crap systems only to throw away all of that work that we've done, right? Oh, wait. 
But the challenge is, if all you can do is patch crappy Flash today, you have to patch crappy Flash today. But we've got some real fundamental problems. I'm going to leave you with these. I'm not going to dive in rather than run late. But uh, here's an old report, seven years old. On a non-technical level, we've got to create incentives to define and deploy trust technologies, as well as understand why the first generation failed. Uh, they fall into the valley of death that exists between research and operational deployment because different communities, silos of excellence, right? Uh, cylinders of excellence, uh, do not communicate. Yeah. Um, they actually proposed in 09 doing um, malicious patching. Like, oh, this, is, this is out of control. We just need to fix stuff against your will. Um, Science of cybersecurity. Most important attributes would be the construction of a common language, set of basic concepts. So we'd have shared understanding. Again, walk the show floor at RSA. Ask somebody what threat intelligence means. <clears throat> Again, MITRE, the precise definitions matter. Until there's a precise set of objects that can be examined carefully and clearly, it won't be possible to increase the level of rigor. The hell are you talking about? And to my point about the, the toilet full of cash, deep understanding, deep underlying. If we don't work with the people in education that are doing research on those big propeller head ideas, we're going to continue to patch, 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 patch. Um, and they, were, they recommended some things, and they didn't think all the way through, because one of these I want to point out is immunology. How do biological systems handle immunology? <laughs> well, it turns out, that most of the species can fail as long as a few of them figure it out enough to uh, rebuild the population. Anybody want to say that's why uh, there are only three machines left operational in your organization as you're explaining it to the CISO? Um, well, it works for biology. As long as you're one of the three that survived. Um, but there are a lot of things to learn. Uh, we know that we need to bridge silos. That's why I like to come out to events and talk to people and make, encourage them. Uh, standardized language and test beds, self-defending hardware, self-defending software. These things are actually possible, right? Things like not the pimp bromium, but those sort of ideas of using micro-virtualization to have you know, rapid restore points, things like that. We need to do this. We need to build systems that operate well in degraded um, environments. It pains me, but that language the uh, cybersecurity framework, most people call it the NIST CSF, but it's now out in the community, be maintained by the community with NIST as curator, is an opportunity to move us forward in that common language. I'm not saying it's my ideal, but it may be happening, and I think it is happening, and so we might want to embrace it, uh, whatever. Um, I hate auto analogies, being an auto mechanic, they're all terrible, but one of the things about the test beds, people like to say, oh, it's all different, it's all different, it's all different. Um, in the car biz, we have standardized tests for safety. They're not perfect. We do not crash every vehicle on the road into every other vehicle on the road at every possible angle and speed. We have a standardized set of things that give us a pretty good idea. There are all sorts of edge cases. The one that I always bring up is the moose strike. I live in New England, have lived in New England a long time. Uh, when you hit a moose, which you do a lot in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and other in Alaska, uh, you knock their legs out from under them and then the moose hits the windshield, and it hits that A pillar on the windshield. It collapses, the moose comes in, you die. Often you don't die right away. You die of the diseases that the ticks on the moose are carrying when they pull you in. Uh, in the ER, they spend a lot of time picking ticks off people that have been moose strikes. Um, that does not mean that when you get in a fender bender because of the way people drive on that highway over there, um, you're not safer. Uh, we even use... Um, surrogates for human testing in auto stuff. Does anybody know what you call a crash test dummy for software? <laughs> Shouldersofinfosec.org. I have a, a bunch of, uh, it's a really crappy wiki, but it has a lot of folks on it, a lot of references, links to other things. If you're interested in some of the folks that came before, um, go out and check it out. I will be around all day and into the evening if you have any questions. Um, I started a little late, ran a little late, but we've still got 10 minutes to 9 minutes to get to the next one. So uh, take it out. Oh, I will have a, a personal request. If anybody 
knows Howard Schmidt, former cybersecurity czar and whatever, if, I would really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes, send me a sentence or two or a paragraph on something about Howard that you remember so I can put it up on the shoulders of InfoSec. He's got some health problems, and instead of uh, telling him how much he meant to us after he's gone, I'd like some of us to share what we think of him while he can still uh, have it read to him. With that, thank you very much. Enjoy the day. Hopefully you had something to think about or at least enough uh, mimosas that it was okay.